On Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1993, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale passed away. The title of one of his best-selling books, The Power of Positive Thinking, had become part of the popular vocabulary of the whole world. But some people thought his message was too simple, that with faith in God you can live an abundant life, as Peale proclaimed. One of my professors in Berkeley attacked Peale mercilessly, comparing Peale unfavorably with the Apostle Paul in the Bible. Another critic declared Paul as appealing, but Peale as appalling. One San Francisco strip teaser even changed her name to Norma Vincent Peale and spelled it P-E-E-L. One man of my acquaintance, whenever he heard somebody say something particularly pessimistic and negative, would say that's the kind of attitude that would make Norman Vincent squeal. The jokes were endless. He was attacked and he was ridiculed. Some said of Peel's message that such simple faith is foolish and naive and that what he said just wouldn't work. But it did and it does. I first met Dr. Peel during the 1970s in New Orleans, Louisiana, at the Fairmont Hotel at a convention of fellow speakers and broadcasters. He was delightful. I had earlier helped Peel's office staff in New York City get him on weekly worldwide radio, a project which we discussed for a while. But I found that I loved this fellow, and from that day in New Orleans, I felt that I had a new friend. He was a truly inspiring, godly, and God-knowing man, balding, bespectacled, round and ruddy, and brimming with enthusiasm, faith, and gracious good humor. But listen now to this letter I received from my friend Ben B. Franklin of Topeka, Kansas, a great lecture agent who booked Dr. Peel and me and hundreds of other speakers coast to coast and border to border across the USA. Ben wrote... On December 24, 1993, one of the best-loved speakers on the American platform passed away, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. Lived an abundant and ebullient 95 years, and he will be sorely missed. Dr. Peale began lecturing for the Associated Clubs, Ben Franklin writes, in 1948, when his first book, A Guide to Confident Living, was published. His best-known book, The Power of Positive Thinking, came out four years later and was translated into more than 40 languages around the world. My first contact with Dr. Peel came in 1963. Ben writes, in April of that year, I was involved in a mountain climbing accident when my rope broke, and I fell more than 100 feet down a cliff face, breaking my back in four places and my pelvis in two. I was paralyzed from the waist down as a result. Less than two weeks later, I received a letter from Dr. Peel, in which he encouraged me and told me he was praying for me. I had yet to meet this great man, but already I was coming to recognize what a very kind and human man he was. I read several of his books later during the four and a half months I spent in the hospitals of Denver. From that time on, our paths crossed every year or so. Dr. Peel spoke to more than 50 clubs at fees far below what most celebrities were charging. He wrote a couple of newspaper columns and a couple of sermons about me, Ben wrote. One of those sermons is enclosed in this letter. Everywhere he went, he broke club attendance records. Dr. Peel continued to lecture for the Associated Clubs until he was almost 94 years old. His last speech for us was delivered to the Metropolitan Dinner Club in Biloxi, Mississippi, on March 26th of 1992. We are such little men when the stars come out. How true that is, and we shall miss you. Dr. Peel wrote Ben Franklin. In his book... How to Build Self-Confidence. Dr. Peel wrote these words about my friend Ben. I have a young friend who has the remarkable name of Benjamin Franklin. Ben was born on the plains of Kansas. And when he was a young boy going to summer camp, he saw the mountains in Colorado for the first time. And he became fascinated with the great towering Rockies, capped with an ermine blanket of snow. He was only nine years old when he began hiking up long trails and he learned the thrill of summits conquered after a long, hard climb. He felt contented as he slept under the stars, listening to the wind in the tall pine trees. He said he liked to smell the pines after a rain and to hear the dashing, singing streams coming from the heights. He became addicted to the charm of the Colorado high country. It was in him to climb, and those mountains became his mountains. All winter long, back in school in Kansas, he would sit in the classroom dreaming of the mountain trails and the high rock formations. Ben really started to live when summer enabled him to hunt great challenges on the slopes. The mountains loved him, and he loved the mountains. That is, until one day in August, when he was 18 years old, climbing with two friends, his rope became frayed on a jagged ridge, and it parted. He was cast backward. He fell 150 feet to the base of the cliff. 
His back was broken in four places and his pelvis in two, but he was still breathing when his friends got down to him. One stayed with Ben, who was only half conscious by that time. The other went for help. Ben seemed to float, he said, within black wool. Everything seemed dark, but he remembered wondering why the mountains had turned against him. Because he loved the mountains. By the time the rescue squad came, Ben was delirious. He was strapped tightly on a stretcher and carried down to the ambulance, which sped him 30 miles with the sirens screaming to a Denver hospital. The surgeons worked to save his life. Ben was paralyzed from the waist down. Finally, he was taken out of intensive care. The doctor sat beside him and said, Ben, I've got to give it to you straight. You're never going to walk again. You'll have to use a wheelchair. Ben could see only the outline of his legs under the sheets, those strong legs like pistons which had projected him up many a mountain slope. Now they would be useless. He couldn't surrender to that fact. The days dragged by, and the wheelchair claimed its victory. Hospital attendants turned him over, washed him, and dressed him. Ben was rebellious and bitter. He was condemnatory of God and everything else. Then after six months of helplessness, even his hate and bitterness drained out of him until one day he said, Okay, God, I surrender to you. I put myself in your hands. I'm your child. You know, God, that I don't want to be this way the rest of my life. If you can't give me the full use of my legs, then give me full use of myself. And then he said there came into his mind the realization that he could will this thing to be true by the help of Almighty God. The next evening... The next evening, he moved a toe. He began to laugh, and he began to shout and cry out, and the nurse came in and leaned over him, and he tried to kiss her, and she quickly ran out of the room. My toe, he exploded. I can move my toe. I can move my toe. Ben poured out a grateful prayer to God, tears streaming down his face. Today, Ben is on heavy braces. He only used the wheelchair for a year. He graduated with high honors from the University of Colorado. He was among the 30 students in CU's 15,000 named to who's who among students in American universities and colleges. He now works as a lecture manager and travels around the world. And if you asked how this came about, he would say that God put it in him to demand of himself that he would live with confidence regardless of how difficult the situation might be. It is a hard message, I know. It isn't always easy to make yourself do things, and you can't always do it the way you want, but God will show you the way. Those the words of Dr. Norman Vincent Peale about my fellow Kansan and my friend Ben Franklin. Well, that was the legacy of Dr. Peel. That's what he left the world when he died that Christmas Eve in 1993, a legacy of faith and hope and love. Listen to these words he wrote in one of his later books. Peel wrote, I was scheduled to speak to a sales convention of a certain industry, and before the meeting, a businessman approached me and said, Dr. Peel, I have one salesman who wouldn't have the initiative to come to this convention on his own, so I invested $200 to bring him. Having read your power of positive thinking, I expect you to get him activated so I can get my money back through his increased sales. I've gotten him a front row seat. I recall reading in one of your books how you built a fire under another sleepy guy in a similar circumstance. The fire was built in him and not under him, I replied, but I will do what I can for your man. He pointed the man out to me. As I was talking, I looked at this salesman now and then. He had a kind of blank expression. <laughs> on his face. He showed no sign of reacting to anything. However, after the meeting, he came up to me and said, my name is Carl. I'm the dull salesman my boss invested money in to bring me here to this convention to try to get me motivated. Next, Peel began bolstering Carl's faith in God, and then he said, let's pray about you. What do you say? Carl said, well, I'd like that. Maybe that's what I need. So I offered a prayer, wrote Peel. And then I ask, now, Carl, how about you saying a few words? I cannot remember Carl's short prayer word for word. I wish I could. It was one of the best I've ever heard. It was most affecting. It went something like this. Lord, I'm a dull, sleepy, no-account guy, but I really don't want to be that way. Honestly, I don't. I'm sick of being the way I am. I just don't amount to anything. And I'm asking, please, revitalize me, God. Amen. And then he looked at me, and after a long silence... He said, you know something, I think God is going to answer that prayer. I think so too, I replied, and I felt sure of it. Before we parted, I told Carl something I'd heard when I was a very young man, which gripped me and had meant much to me all across the years. I heard a man once say, you can become strongest in your weakest place. 
He was referring to weakness of character. I recalled how this man used as an illustration the process of welding in which two pieces of metal are fused under intense heat. He asserted that if an effort should be made later to break the joined metal, it would probably not break at the welded place since due to molecular fusion under heat, that had become the strongest part. Well, Carl said, that's for me, because apathy is sure my weakest place. I promise you I'll follow your advice and try to get spiritually welded back together again. Beale wrote, Carl's apathy began to give way. The intense heat of real faith and prayer and joyous release fused his conflicted personality until he did indeed become strongest at his weakest place. In fact, he became positively dynamic and alive in the fullest sense. He joined one of the service clubs in town, and he really got into its work. Within three years, he was president of the local chamber of commerce. It seemed eventually, according to many, that... He'd done more for his town to build it up than any man in a decade. People used to come and tell me Carl is a real ball of fire. And that was an understatement. At Carl's request, I went back to his town to make a speech. He met my plane. I said, you know, Carl, I've been on the go steadily. I want to go to my hotel room and just lie down and rest before I give my speech tonight. Rest, Carl said. Why should you rest? Where's that energy and that spiritual enthusiasm you're always talking about and writing about? So I gave in sheepishly wrote Dr. Peel. He said, all right, let's forget the hotel. Where do you want to go? Well, he showed me around, and his enthusiasm so rubbed off on me that I forgot all about being tired. Dr. Peel wrote, Carl is only one of the hundreds of people across the years in whom I have seen the marvelous process of spiritual change take place, whereby the dead, the spiritually dead people, learn to live again, to come to life listless, de-energized, even cynical. These men and women have in one way or another got into proximity with the dynamic person who said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And then something happened in each case. Some emanation of stepped up vitality and energy passed into them so that no longer were they the same men and women. They became completely different from what they had been. The new spirit showed in their eyes, in their step, indeed in their entire demeanor. And it showed also in the amazing results that came to them in the form of upgraded creativity. The New Testament says all things are become new. These men had their lives changed, bursting now with eagerness and aliveness, with a grip on their lives and their jobs. They know for a fact, for a wonderful fact, that enthusiasm makes the difference. And that was a bit of the legacy of my friend, the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. You've been listening to a special edition of our regular broadcast, Vern Benham Grimsley reporting. And then write to us, will you, at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. We have free literature on these things, on finding God, getting to know God, growing spiritually, the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man. What happens when you pray? What good does it do to pray? How do you pray? Write for all this. No cost, charge, or obligation when you write to us at Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell that mailing address. That's Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Denham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day. <laughs>